What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in today's episode, which was originally made available to premium subscribers only, is famed short seller Mark Cahotis. The last time Mark and I spoke was at one of Jim Grant's conferences in the fall of 2016. And I remember Jim introducing him to the audience as someone who has this uncanny ability to come to the essence of any story and to tell it in a way that everyone can understand. And he's used that ability time and again throughout his career, famously exposing numerous corporate frauds at great personal expense to himself and his family, which has gotten him into quite a bit of trouble over the years, from members of the Russian mafia threatening his life to the FBI reportedly being used to silence him for his investigations into Mimetic's founder and convicted fraudster Parker Petit. So he's not a stranger to dealing with very dangerous people and uncovering very dark and oftentimes criminal conspiracies. Hopefully, today's conversation doesn't prove as expensive or hazardous, but it certainly has the potential to be. Mark has been early in exposing what is now a rapidly evolving disaster for the crypto industry. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you either live under a rock or you've been too consumed with US election coverage to even notice. The story I'm talking about is the recent bankruptcy of FTX, one of the largest crypto exchanges, and the likely impending arrest of its CEO and founder, Sam Bankman-Fried, for what is believed to be a multi-billion dollar securities fraud. Up until last week, Sam, or SBF as he is otherwise known, was the golden child of the crypto industry. He's rubbed shoulders with some of the most powerful people in the world, from Bill Clinton and Tony Blair to Tom Brady and Giselle Bündchen. He was, up until very recently, working closely with regulators to help craft regulations for the crypto industry. And in 2020, he made the second largest donation to Joe Biden's presidential campaign, behind only George Soros. On its surface, this looks like your typical financial fraud case, and in some sense, it is. But there are elements to this story that are uniquely suspicious, like Sam's own origins and how he developed his wealth to begin with, the origins of his co-founder, who no one talks about, and other members of his organization, and how this otherwise disheveled multi-billionaire who reportedly sleeps on a futon in the Bahamas came to exercise so much political influence and hold so many ownership stakes in companies and venture funds in and outside of crypto. It's a story that Mark's been working on for almost a year, and it's the focus of today's explosive conversation. If you want access to premium content like it, including subscriber-only episodes, early releases, episode transcripts, and intelligence reports, you can sign up for those at hiddenforces.io. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your phone using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want access to our Hidden Forces Genius community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events and dinners, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, please enjoy this incredibly timely and explosive conversation with my guest, Mark Cahotis. Mark Cahotis, welcome to Hidden Forces. Well, thanks for having me, Dimitri. It's great having you on, Mark. We met once a long time ago, but I don't think you remember. It was at that Grants Conference where you switched out of your shirt into a Canada jacket, and you had the audience up in stitches talking about all your your adventures. That was was a lot of fun, and that seems like decades ago, but I do remember that. That was a good time. Some of those ideas work, too. So for those in our audience who don't know who you are, Mark, give us a quick background into your your history, what you do, and your interest in the subject that we're going to talk about today, which is the insolvency of FTX, and basically all the reverberations and implications of that. Okay. So I'm a 62-year-old 
fellow. I started, you know, I've really been interested in markets since I was 16. I did horrible in school. I'm from Chicago. My grades were quite bad. I barely got into a place called Babson College where I graduated in four years with a undergraduate degree in finance. I worked part-time at Merrill Lynch helping a broker out, but I've always had the stock kind of bug, always. And when I graduated college, I got a job at the Northern Trust in Chicago. I was making $17,500 a year, interest rates were 18%. And I was the first person out of college they hired in the investment departments. That was fun. Lasted there three years. They didn't like me because I was too bullish. Imagine that. And uh, I went to work with David Rocker in New York, where Rocker Partners started with $20 million. Back then, hedge funds were big at $200 million, so we started with 20 Worked with David till about 2003, 2004. Moved to California in 91. I have a son who was born with cerebral palsy and his therapy was out here, so I moved out here. Again, worked with David till 2004. Closed the fund in 2009 for various reasons that everyone can look up. And I've sort of been investing for myself since, I don't know, 2012 to now. And I have a blast. I have a lot of fun doing it. I am beyond aggressive. Uh, most people know me as a short seller. I tend to sniff out frauds. I think I'm kind of good at it. But I also do longs and have longs. And, and some of the longs work. Some don't. But I enjoy what I do. I have fun. And I have a, a good nose for rascals, troublemakers, frauds, thieves, and crooks. And I think that's why you want me on here today. Yeah, that is kind of part of the job description. For people that want to know more about your history, Mark, or your other takes on, on other frauds or companies you've pursued, they can find a number of videos online. I think, I don't know if any of Grant stuff posts, but I know you've been on Grant Williams's those long form, beautiful video interviews. Grant interviewed you some while back, so people can find that online, presumably. And uh, so I encourage them to do that if they're interested in your backstory. So let's talk about FTX, Sam Bankman Freed, and everything else. I mean, we could talk about Binance too. I don't know if that's something that you want to talk about or if it's relevant anymore because Binance backed out of the deal. And as we speak today now, I should actually say, because this is like such a fast moving thing. This is the afternoon, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, November 10th. Binance backed out of the deal with FTX and Alameda Research. There are a number of other firms that are take quick looks and hard passes at this. I actually just tweeted out that it feels a lot like that classic templated scene in mob movies where the guy at the end is like, or the guy in the scene is kind of pleading for his life, but everybody knows, including him, that he's going to die, but he keeps begging anyway. So I just feel like we all know where this is going. But the question... Well, actually, before I ask the question, why don't you tell me what happened here? Maybe you can start with that. Like, why don't you talk to our listeners like they have no clue what the story is? What is your interpretation of what happened here? Let's sort of start at like the beginning, beginning. And I think if, you know, people are interested in what I've done or my history or things like that, I think there's, I must have 10 to 12 real vision things out there. And there's been two Harvard Business School cases done on me, so I think you can get those from Harvard. And, you know, I'm generally online, so people can figure it out. I have a lot of lovers and a lot of haters, so you can go from there. Back to SBF. So let's just call him Sam for simple sake going forward, and we'll call it FTX. So I tend to look at nuances of things. Nuances bother me. I try not to look at the bright, shiny object. The bright, shiny object turns me on and the way that I always think there's something there if someone gets too much publicity or the story is different or you know something doesn't make sense. And that's the case with Sam and FTX. He was getting a lot of publicity. I started paying attention to him because something didn't fit. And when I listened to this guy, nothing he said made sense. I've listened to interviews with him on Bloomberg or CNBC, which I call the Cartoon Network, various you know 
know, long and short things. And he talks, I would say, in a figure eight. Nothing adds up. Nothing makes sense. There's no explanation to it. And that really had me intrigued because when they call him the J.P. Morgan of crypto or the next Warren Buffett, it always sort of piques my interest, especially for a guy who has no background, no mentor, no resume, no nothing. So I started getting intrigued with this guy probably in the spring of this year. I've never touched crypto. I've never owned a stick of it. I've never been short a stick of it. I could care less. And I always say, if you've made money on crypto, God bless you. I don't understand it. I always say that you shouldn't be in an investment unless you can explain it to a 10th grader in a paragraph or less. And no one's been able to explain crypto to me ever. So I'm not a crypto guy. But I'm a heat-seeking missile when it comes to frauds and criminals and criminality, of which I think Sam is. I think he's a sociopath, and I think he's probably one of the great financial criminals since Madoff, and I don't say that lightly. So what was it about Sam and what he did that got me turned on? Well, first of all, when you listen to him, his story doesn't add, and it made no sense. There were never any details of how he made his money who financed it, how he learned this stuff. He was just a intern at something called Jane Street Capital, and he has no training, no mentor, no one who could vouch for him. He also has a partner named Gary Wang at FTX, and the only thing you can really find on Gary Wang on the internet is one picture, and a picture of his back facing a computer where he was a advisor to Sequoia who, by the way, owned some FTX and wrote it off last night down to zero. So his partner, Gary Wang, who I think is a member of the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, was allegedly, you know, at one point worth $11 billion as the so-called co-founder of FTX. You can't find anything on Gary Wang. You can't find anything on him. You can't find zero. And that's beyond suspicious. So Sam, when he talks, makes no sense. He has no mentor. He has no one who trained him. No one knows where he got his money, where he made this crypto country arbitrage trade. No one can find anything. And that's bizarre because I have mentors. I can remember all my good trades. I try to forget all my bad trades. And I can go into great detail about my career, who I met everything down the line. And and the great ones can do that. And if you have a big hit, you always remember your big hits and can articulate it. So he doesn't have that. Then he has this partner, Wang, who you can't find anything on. Then there's the head of regulatory at FPX, a guy named Dan Friedberg, who prior to that worked at an online poker was a lawyer at an online poker company that was uh, guilty of cheating, giving other people uh, your face cards. So Freeberg, who is the head of regulatory at FTX, decided to omit that from his uh, CV and his LinkedIn. And the only reason I know about this is I started squawking on Twitter back in May that I think something's very wrong at FTX and some professional poker players who I know said you should look into Dan Freeberg. So the head of regulatory at FTX to me is beyond shaky. Then you have the so-called crypto winter where the markets blew up and everyone was doing poorly, yet somehow FTX said they were doing well, which makes no sense to me because if volumes are down, the assets down, interest rates are up. That's not a good time to be a so-called crypto exchange and or broker. So you had that going on. And then on top of all those things, Sam decided to invest in what I would think are frauds, Ponzi's and schemes, whether it's Celsius, which went bust or Voyager, which went bust or Scaramucci, who had all sorts of problems. He invested in these five gimmicky 
projects, if you will, which makes no sense because if you want to invest in a fraud, you wait for the fraud to go completely bankrupt and then you invest, but you have protection. You don't invest in the front side of a scam because you'll lose everything you have. So you put all that together, it gets to be real interesting to a guy like me. And I thought he was a fraud when I gathered everything because it checks all the boxes of the things I just said. And I went out on my Twitter in May, which is at Alder Lane Eggs, and I was chirping about this guy quite aggressively. And in June, I said the best short on the board right now is Sam Bankman Freed and FTX. And at that point, I have an open DM direct message. I kept getting messages from people who used to be big accounts at FTX, who FTX screwed, FTX traded in front of them. FTX destroyed people's lives. They destroyed tokens, which were issued and traded. So these guys make Citadel in terms of front running and screwing their customers look like the Pope. And you put all that together, you have something that's nasty. You have something that's messed up. You have something that's offshore. I was intrigued that Tom Brady and Giselle were spokespeople here. And I also found it bizarre that Sam, who actually looks like the inside of a gym shoe and whose hair is a, just a complete mop and is just an absolute slob, has billboards of himself across the country. And that, to me, makes just zero sense because he's not selling himself. He should be selling this brokerage firm like E-Trade or someone like that. So you put all that stuff together. It hit all the high notes, and I said to myself, this thing is a giant scam. And more and more people kept DMing me of what he was doing and how it was going and how it didn't make sense. And I got more and more vocal on Twitter as the summer went on, and it's kind of a big, powerful feedback loop. The more I talk about it, the more people interact with me. And I have a lot of stuff. I have a lot of goods on this guy. and. I've been working with a Pulitzer Prize winner journalist. I think there's going to be something coming out shortly on how they do criminality behind it, how they attempted to try to make their money, and, and more importantly, how they screwed people. And my friend saw me tweeting and talking about this thing and said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? They said, well, it's not a stock. There's no way to play it or make money. And I said, that's great. And this is the key point that I want people to always remember. I did this one for free. I did this because this is such a despicable, undesirable motherfucker. I wanted him off the streets. I wanted him out of the business. I wanted him exposed, and he is exposed now. And I didn't make a dime on it. I went through great risk to expose this guy, but he's so bad. And what they're doing is so wrong and so dangerous and so screwing people. There, I didn't stand the profit from exposing this guy. I didn't get paid. No one's paying me. I, I don't have an investment play. I wasn't short the tokens at FTX. I did this, and I decided to do this project because I think the world is a better place without this guy and without FTX in business. So when someone says, what was your motivation? You know, People know me as a short seller, and when I'm short something, I say I'm short the stock. Like when you saw me talking about Canada. I exposed Home Capital Group as the fraud it was, but that thing had a symbol and I made money being short the stock. But I said I was short the stock. And when I was short that Canadian drug fraud, Concordia, and the stock went from 100 to zero, I was short the stock. And I was short Valiant. And I was short other things. And I admit I'm short. There's nothing wrong with it. And it's totally legal. I did not stand the benefit at all by exposing FTX and SAM, not one bit anything, I put myself at risk. But to me, the prize, the ultimate prize here is watching this guy go out of business and watching him probably end up in prison. And that'll give me great satisfaction because I've spent a lot of time on this, busted my ass. And I didn't really speak out. You know, I wasn't interviewed by the mainstream media because people wanted to ignore me on this, but I'm not an ignore kind of guy. And I kept going on Twitter and you know, in the last, you know, kind of eight to 10 days, this thing has really uh, come unglued and, and people, you know, again, Twitter searchable, they they realized how outspoken I've really been on this thing. So you said that Sam Bankman-Fried came onto your radar 
in the spring of 2022, and you first tweeted about what makes you suspicious about him in May of this year. Mm -hmm. What was the period of time when you began investigating him? And when did you go from, man, this guy checks all of the boxes just from an appearance standpoint and all the red flags to like, this is, I've come across some really damning information here and I'm confident that this person is running some type of fraud, Ponzi, whatever. So that's a good question. So really in the kind of late winter, very early spring, you know, winter of 21, early 22, I started realizing that something's terribly wrong with this guy or something terribly wrong with the story, terribly wrong with the narrative. It kind of like makes no sense. And that's when I started, you know, putting together the pieces. That's when it started to, I started to realize that this thing like makes no sense. And sort of how I operate is I sort of throw the the big net out through Twitter. I have 80 some odd thousand followers. And, you know, there's a lot of people lurking around who know things that I don't know. And there's a lot of people who have information, but they don't know what to do with it, or they're too scared to come with it. And people, you know, know that I'm not afraid of anything. And they know that if they give me information and the information is good, I can run with it. And that's sort of what happened. But all of the factors that sort of came together along with him being the second largest donor to the Democratic Party, there's a guy who was born in America who spent a lot of time in Hong Kong. And then when he leaves Hong Kong, why wouldn't he come back to the United States? The guy went to the Bahamas and then he sleeps on a futon. There's nothing wrong with sleeping on a futon, but if you're worth $11 billion, I think you would do better than sleep on a futon on the beach. And then, you know, you have the Friedberg, the Dan Friedberg stuff, who's just a common, just a, a true low life. Why, if you're running an exchange, why in the world would you have a guy like that there? Then I went through LinkedIn on the FTX International guys and the FTX US guys. And all these people there, none of them had any exchange experience and or talent. None of them really are any good. I wouldn't hire one of them. These are the people who are running the show. So that looks like a front to me. And SBF has no experience running an exchange. He has no experience running a business. He's come from nowhere. So then as that started festering and I began to gather information with people uh, DMing me and calling me with stuff. You know, the head of U.S. quit and another person quit. When you said the head of U.S. quit, can you be, be more specific and help me walk me through this timeline so my listeners and I can understand where we are? All this stuff is, is sort of out there. It's sort of public. I think the head of FTX U.S., I'm drawing a blank on the man's name right now. He quit about a month, month and a half ago. And a guy named Tribuco, who is an Alameda Research employee, a higher up guy, he quit probably three weeks before that. So let's also take a step back here again, because I don't want to take anyone's knowledge for granted. There are two companies here that are at play. Alameda Research, which, as I understand it, is the proprietary trading arm of Sam Bankman-Fried, and FTX, which is the exchange arm, which, among other things, has customer deposits and people are able to actively trade on the platform, correct? And this is what we're talking about when we talk about Alameda Research and FTX. And Alameda Research has a CEO and the CEO of, or a co-CEO, I mean, you tell me, like, I don't know that, again, to, so by the way, just to validate, like, absolutely suspicious, no doubt, but to be fair, there are a lot of projects that are super suspicious in crypto. So that's kind of the starting point for all of this. There's a lot of this kind of stuff going on, but I just wanted to say that, but pick up where you were, Mark, for, I just wanted people to understand what we were talking about. Well, to digress, yeah, there's a lot of projects suspicious of crypto, but that's why I don't deal with crypto. I more or less deal with people. I have a saying, you bet the jockey, not the horse. The jockey's great. You go long the stock. If the jockey sucks, you short the stock. But again, there's no way to short it here. But if you start looking at the, for lack of a better word, the mosaic of the story, there's no one at either of these companies that in my mind has talent. There's no one, you know, and I know plenty of talented people. The CEO of Target is a good friend of mine. He's a talented man, Brian Cornell. He employs half a million people. He knows what he's doing. He's a real guy. 
There's no one at FTX or Alameda or anyone attached to them who I would view as a real guy. They're all, to me, either fakes or they're nothings. And you got to be somebody to manage this kind of business, this kind of leverage with this kind of complexity. But there's no one there to do it, which is another red flag. And when the people who have no talent leave, that's a double red flag. So all these things were going on. These people left in, let's just say, the late, the mid to late summer. And someone DM'd me and said, you realize that the chief operating officer, a lady, went to what's considered CCP University in Canada. Are you talking about Caroline Ellison, whose father is over at MIT? No. Is that the no, person? She's her. the CEO of Alameda Research. Okay. All right. That's fine. I just wanted to, again, there are a lot of different characters. Yeah. This is an FTX person. You know, what, what I'm saying and what I'm trying to do is this is all anecdotal of things that check the boxes or wave red flags. But since I think Wang, who no one can find anything about, since I think he's an operative, I also think the COO is an operative. We know that the head of regulatory has a problem uh, cheating and poker. And you know, again, when you put this together, there's no one on this roster. There's no one at this company who I view as legitimate. There's no one at this company who I view as a person who can actually run a company. Okay. So let's talk about this. Actually, just for listeners to know, you're actually talking about Constance Wang, who yeah. is the COO of FTX. Yeah, that's her. Let's talk about because I've written out a bunch of notes as we're talking, and I'm just trying to figure out where to focus. Let's go ahead and talk about Gary Wang, because that's a pretty big allegation that there is a CCP connection. I don't really know exactly what that means. And I also, I want to really understand what evidence is there for that? Or is this mainly just kind of a constellation of connections and it's circumstantial, but there's no really smoking gun that points to any kind of affiliation? Well, see, that's exactly right. But that's all this thing has ever been, right? Because if you're a guy who's worth $11 billion, I don't care who you are. There's stuff out there on them. There's stuff out there on you. You know, you can't go through such pain to hide yourself if you're worth that much money. And the story on Wang and Sam is they met at a summer math camp in Canada. and. Okay, that's fine. And then went to MIT together. Okay, that's fine. Then they somehow got together and started this FTX. Okay, that's a bit of a stretch, but fine. But in terms of Wang, you can't find him. And in some of the stuff that I dug on prior companies, this guy, you know, when you're from China and you come either to Canada or the United States and you have money, you're either part of the party, you're part of the CCP, or you're kind of like a money laundering criminal. It's one of the two, because the average person in China doesn't have you know, a pot to piss in. And this is a problem that I, I used to work on when I was doing all my Canadian stuff. And there is no in-between. You're either you know in one class or you're the other. So... It's my view in my working thesis that this guy, Wang, is with or affiliated with the CCP because he was very well-to-do. Now, can I be wrong? I can be totally wrong. But one of the problems is there's nothing out there on Wang. Nothing. And I find that in itself to be very, very suspicious that there is nothing out there on Wang. And he has an affiliation with Sequoia. And what kind of guy in a Sequoia report has a picture of himself of his back as he's facing a computer? It makes no sense. Well, what is his relationship with Sequoia? And besides the fact that Sequoia invested in FTX? Well, it said he was an advisor. So probably because he was there, he probably advised Sequoia to do this thing and completely bagged them. But Wang, in all the publicity of everything with FTX, Wang somehow has stayed out of the light of the media. No one knows or talks about Wang. I'm the only guy who even brings him up. No one even knows he exists, which to me is sort of a story in itself. And it's like, who's Wang? Who is this guy? 
who is Gary Wang? Well, that's a problem. I mean, you're really you're you're actually nailing a, a bigger problem that's true. Whether we're talking about Alameda, FTX, whether we're talking about USDT, Tether, Bitfinex, and all these different companies, there are so many shady characters, and there's no transparency on the books at all. And it's one of the great ironies in crypto that you have these highly centralized, non-transparent institutions that sit at the heart of what is supposed to be a decentralized ecosystem. Okay. Let's say I agree with you 100%, right? Sure. I don't even give a rat's ass about that. My simple point is, if you're running a real company and assume FTX is real, right? Which it's not. It's probably a criminal operation at this point because they took customers' money, right? They took customers' money and used it for themselves, which is illegal. So assume this thing is legit. You should at least be able to no touch feel, read about, interview, talk to Gary Wang. And no one Did you has. reach out to Sequoia no. and ask them about him? No. I mean, I had a pal and they base a pal do it. You know, I'm kind of a known guy. So they know when I call up, they know. Yeah, I wouldn't I'm take your trouble. call either. <laughs> exactly. If I, if I so was that them. doesn't work. So I had go betweens reach out to Sequoia to get Wang and they got nothing. I mean, I went to Bloomberg and said, you guys should get an interview with Wang and Sam together in a room. They were turned down. So if this guy exists and if he's worth $11 billion and if he's a co-founder of FTX, you should be able to touch, feel, talk to, examine, ask questions of this guy Wang. So the fact you can't, to me, is more suspicious than anything. You know, the concept of the DeFi and, and all this other bullshit they say with crypto, it's just all bullshit. It's just all something to lure people in. So I don't even get caught in that. But if someone is worth $11 billion and someone is a co-founder and someone is allegedly real, you should be able to get an email address for them, talk to them, meet them, anything with Sam. So, I mean, I don't even know if Gary Wang even exists. I mean, who knows? Yeah, no, no, that stuff's totally insane that you can have companies like this that are running, managing billions of dollars of people's money, and there's really like no regulatory oversight whatsoever. They're managing tens, if not a hundred, God even knows of what people's money. And what we're doing is, you know, the initial question is, what got you interested? I mean, I think I've named about 32 red flags that I have flying on this thing including a co-founder who no one's met, talked to, can't email, can't identify, and nothing on, right? So, so when you add it all up, along with what I got from my DMs, which a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, you know, is working on this big story of what I really have on this, which I can't get into today because I'm not going to jump someone's story that I've been working on with them. Well, let's talk. I don't want you to tell me details. I don't want to, you know, mess anything up there. So, but I do want to. I want to talk around it, and I want to try to understand what you're talking about here. So, the two operative questions here are: Do you have a time frame for when this information is going to come out? Actually, a couple of questions, and I want you to answer them all, Mark. Do you have a general idea of when this story is going to come out? Second question is: Why have you decided to go this route? Did you give this information to anybody else? And what? What does this information that you have that you've been working on add to this story? Because as the story stands today, the way that I understand it is roughly speaking, and this is, again, this is not all confirmed. This is just me looking from the outside, trying to understand what's happened here. It seems that somewhere along the way, FTX went broke, and that might have been in the summer this year where companies like Celsius, Voyager went broke. And- they began to raid customer accounts. And at some point recently, they basically ran out of customer funds or that became very clear to other people. It became clear to CZ over at Binance, et cetera. And basically there was a run on the bank and they blew up. That is kind of what it seems like. Plus they have this Ponzi dynamics with the FTT token. That's what I see from the outside. How much bigger is this story that people are missing that you're speaking to? It's much bigger. And everything you said is 100% true. And you're 100% right. Everything you said is true. 
But what I have and others have and others are working on, it's a whole lot bigger. When you took this information to other MSM outlets, I don't know if you want to tell us who they were. What did they say? Why did they not want to go with this story? I first took it to the Bloomberg crypto team in London, five people, and they were too lazy and didn't want to put in the time and energy to figure it out. This what was did they say to you, July. though? What was their response to you when you, when you gave them this story? They were very apathetic. They said it's going to take a lot of work. They said it's going to take a lot of time. I said, I totally understand it. I said, but maybe you should do something before the election because this guy's the second largest donor of the Democratic Party, and it's a big deal. So maybe if you guys start working on it now, you could expose this thing before the election because this guy behind George Soros is the biggest donor to the Democrats. And they said it's too much work and, you know, we, we can't get them together. You know, it's just a bunch of bullshit. But I know bullshit all the time. And, and the mainstream media has gotten very lazy, very lazy. So they were apathetic and they wanted basically me to write the story for them, which is something I just don't do. Let me interject again. And I want you to continue because I want to, again, let people know, again, context here. That I've read the same thing. I haven't looked further into it, but I did read the same thing that he was the second biggest booster to Joe Biden and either to Joe Biden and the Democrats or just to Joe Biden. It's Joe Biden and the Democrats. There are pictures of Sam Bankman Freed all over the internet with Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Giselle, Tom Brady, I think the former CFTC commissioner. I mean, he, it's kind of wild. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like it's almost like a combination of like Jeffrey Epstein and like some weird cut and paste program, just putting his picture into different people. Maxine Waters, you know, the whole thing. And also subtly in here, there's a respect thing. You know, all these people, you know, whether you like Democrats or Republicans or Maxine Waters, all these people sort of deserve respect. And this guy's showing up in an unwashed pair of shorts and T-shirt and, you know, messy hair and the whole thing. You know, it's a complete lack of respect that this schlep shows up and is taking pictures just because he's allegedly worth $11 billion, which I thought was a joke to begin with. But let's get back to your other thing with like going to the mainstream media and, and why to do it. Well, if I'm sitting there squawking on Twitter, you know, there's a lot of people who pay attention to me. But it's not like that big of a, a story where the world just stops and says, what's Mark Cahota's tweeting about? But if someone who's won a Pulitzer Prize or three starts writing about these things, then people start really paying attention. And Bloomberg is a real outfit. And the person I'm working with is very real. And the Times is real. And the Journal's real. But it's a matter of finding someone who has the energy and the heart and the stomach to go after this stuff. Because it takes work and it takes time and it takes heart and it takes gusto to do it. But that's how things get exposed. I mean, if you people out there think that, you know, reporters just come up with all this stuff or journalists come up with all this stuff, it's wrong. They have sources. So I have sources through my DMs and through who I am, who I am that have come to me and I put all this stuff together. I distill it in a form where I have a story and I take it to a journalist. And the journalist basically writes about the information that I have or have gathered through sources or people like that. And I put some research through it. So it's a real process, but that's how things have to get or should get exposed. And why did I do it? I did it because, you know, where I started the conversation, I can't stand criminals. I can't stand cheaters. I can't stand frauds because what they do is they rip off people who can't afford to lose, unsuspecting people who can lose it all. And I, and I hate it, and I don't like it. And I think you're right. Part of this front line has been exposed from the CZ standpoint. You know, I, I get it. I get that, right? But the other part, the part of how these guys do business and things like that haven't been exposed. And what they've done to people and how they lose and what the company does to them and how companies run in front and screw customers. It's bad. It's really bad. How much of this story is sort of basic criminality, greed story? And how much of it is about something 
about political entanglements and non-commercial motivations. Like, how would you describe that? Because you mentioned the reason, obviously, is we've got the fact that he's a huge booster. And you mentioned the CCP, and I still don't quite understand the relevance. Because let's say he is involved in the Chinese Communist Party. FTX, it's a crypto exchange. It's not like, you know, a satellite providing information to the NSA. So what's the relevance, really, if he is involved with the CCP? You're a sharp guy. I'm going to answer it slowly, but I really want you to think of that question, right? Think of Canada when you you met me, when I was talking about money laundering in Canada, right? And I was talking about subprime mortgages and things like that. The real trick, if you're a bad, a bad player, you know, like China in the U.S., we're not exactly friendly with them, wouldn't you say? I mean, if we're not selling them semiconductor chips or equipment or things like that, we're not exactly friendly. But if they can have a Trojan horse where they can take laundered money and use FTX's pipes to run it into this country in crypto, which is not trackable, you know, you can easily turn crypto into U.S. dollars or U.S. treasuries. And you take unidentified, an unidentified asset, which is crypto, whether it's stable coin, whatever, tether, un, whatever bullshit you want. You can basically bring it from over there to in here, exchange it for dollars, and then you have laundered money inside the country through a firm which is basically compromised, which is FTX. Now, I can't prove any of that, but that's my working theory, and I think we're getting closer and closer for that to being true. Have you informed any regulators in the U.S. about this? I'm not getting into what I do in terms like that because I'm not going to get myself you know, I got myself in an FBI tangle once with my medics. Assume I'm working pretty hard, you know, on all aspects to get this thing exposed. And I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not. Are you concerned not, for your personal safety at this time? Fuck no. Hell no. I'm 62 years old. I've been through the FBI, you know, with, with all their stuff. The guy who I exposed went to prison. I operate in broad daylight. I'm not. I'm not afraid of much, right? Plus, plus, I don't really have any names. I can't even find Gary Wang. So I'm, it's not like I'm saying it's Wee G Poo. I don't know anybody. But my working theory is all these guys are compromised with laundered money going through this thing, and no one quite knows who's on first. And no one knows who's on first because there's so much money floating around, whether in political contributions or God knows PR firms to motivate the mainstream media. No one really knows what's going on. Why have regulators been so derelict, not just with FTX, with this giant blow up, but with so many of the things that have been going on the last so many years? What explains that? Is it, I mean, I'm curious to hear your, your take on it. Well, first of all, they're captured. Second of all, a commissioner of the SEC. Again, I'm drawing a blank on his name. It's been Gary quite a week for me. No, another, no, another guy. Not Gensler. A former commissioner, you know, left his job at the SEC, paying him three hundred grand. Callahan is his name. He's at Robinhood. He left his job at the SEC, getting paid three hundred grand a year, to be in the chief legal officer at Robinhood, and I think he made. Somewhere between 80 and $200 million his first year there. So when you can capture the regulators and you can get them looking the other way, when you play offense with no defense, you can score a lot of points. You can do a whole lot of things. Is it also, how much of it is also the fact that speculators have just not wanted to hear it? They've just wanted to gamble. They've wanted upside. They wanted to ignore downside. And so the the kind of the politics around getting blamed for bringing down the market were such that regulators just didn't want to touch it, whether it was, I'm not going to name names in equity markets, but there are a lot of stocks that you know, would fit this profile. And similarly in crypto, where they just don't want to be blamed for ending the party. And so that kind of raises the question, are we now at a point in time where they're more likely to regulate because of the fact that the market's been dumping, et cetera? You know, that, that that's all possible, but you know, regulators should do their jobs, whether the market's up or down. Regulators should do their jobs, whether people are bullish or bearish. I mean, they have a job to do. They need to do their jobs. 
problem is get blamed. You know, that's not really the right word to me. The thing is, is when you have something like this on their watch, this is what they're paid to do. I mean, not everyone likes a regulator or not everyone wants to be a regulator, but not everyone wants to be a policeman. You know, policemen have a job to do to uphold law and order, and they should do the job. Not everyone wants to be in the Army, Navy, or Marines, but those people fight for their country. There's people with jobs to do, and you got to do your job. Regulators haven't done their job. Why have they not done their job? I don't know. Maybe they don't do their job because they want to get a job, you know, being a lawyer or being a partner at a law firm. And if they think they do their job too well, no one will hire them, hire them because they think they're a bad guy or, a, you know, someone who's tough on crime. I don't have the answers. I don't have answers to other people's motivation. I have questions. I have theories. I have a mosaic on the story. I think I have a handle on what's gone wrong or how it can go wrong. And I just, you know, and I just try to do my best here to expose it. And I think I've done a really good job. I mean, the story's far from over. One of the other things that's come out during this time, Mark, is all the different investments that Sam Bankman-Fried has in a bunch of these different companies. I mean, we mentioned some of them already. You just mentioned, like you just mentioned Robinhood. He's an investor in Robinhood. I believe also, I mean, I can't even remember, honestly. Like, I, I'm afraid to say then, something. Then it's come out, he's made VC investments, even though he has no money or no cash. And then he's invested in Scaramucci's fund of funds. I mean, he's in all this stuff. That makes How much information zero. do you have about that? I mean, I have some. But, you know, again, this is a private company, right, of a guy who's not transparent, who lives in the Bahamas, who has a partner that no one has seen knows can get a hold of, where no one can get his email. There is zero transparency. He may stay missing. I mean, God knows how many people who lost money, what kind of gangsters or criminals have money on his exchange. There's a shit pot of people who've lost money. And there's a shit pot of people who've lost a lot of money. And there's a shit pot of people who've lost money because this guy ran ahead. There's, there's, there's all sorts of issues here, big issues. And all I can do, you know, I don't have subpoena power. I'm just a guy. Right? I don't have a firm. I'm a guy. That's all I am. Just a person. Now, I work at a high level and I think I'm fucking good at what I do, but but I don't have a team of six. I have no one. I got me. I have a, a friend of mine who I'm very close to who's working on this thing with me, but that's it. So so I can only do so much legally. I can't uh hack someone's email. I can't tap their phones. I can't break in. You know, it's a, a lot of this is what has been thrown my way and what, what I've put together through experience. And I, I've done this for a very long time. So whose court is the ball in right now? And what would you want to see? What do you think the right course of action is here? Who needs to act right now in your estimation and to look for what exactly? So one course of action will be, I think when this story comes out and it should come out soon, I think it's going to create huge outrage of what a hypocrite and criminal this guy is, that he's not charitable, that his business was ripping off and running in front of others. So everything that he says is that he wants to make the world better and make things peaceful and all this other bullshit. It's just a lie. He rips people off. His exchange front runs his customers and rips them off flat up. What would I like to see? I'd like to see the government go to them and say, we want to talk to you. We want to have a chat with you. And then also they go and find who this Wang guy is, if Wang even exists. I mean, you need to go there because the losses here are going to be in the mega, mega, mega billions. I mean, north of 10, I mean, probably north of 20 of what people have lost. I mean, the tokens, there are $8 billion worth of tokens. This week, they've gone from 26 to two. So, you know, someone's lost seven billion, eight, seven and a half billion just in the tokens. So, what would be good is if people can begin to start to hold people accountable and the difficult questions that I have and have asked begin to get answered. Or if they can't be answered, find out why they can't be answered. 
because there's always answers to questions. You just may not like the answer. They may be incriminating. They may be bad. They may be negative. You know, there's a lot of stuff here. And again, taking down a $32 billion outfit and this kind of guy, it just doesn't happen every day. You know, and in my Twitter, which is at Alderlane Eggs, you know, I said, this guy is the best short on the board since June. So 32 billion to zero is pretty good. Now, did I make a dime? Hell no, because there's no stock here. No, you'd have to short it on the exchange and good luck getting your money back right. from there. Well, that's just it. Someone said, you know, would you do the tokens? I said, no, because I'd have to put collateral up. And if I think the thing is as big a scam as it is, why would I want any collateral at this shithole place? So that's in and itself kind of an issue. So this is a giant tangled web of complete and utter garbage and crap. It is just complete horseshit. And I think, yeah, it's blown up for the narrative that you described and you eloquently described it. But I think there's more to come on exactly what FTX did to people and what they did to people and how many billions they've cost people to me is a story. It's a sad story, but it's a great story. It's a great story as a story. And I feel bad for the people who they completely and utterly destroyed, which is many. No, it is deeply sad. And that's not something that should be lost on any one of us. It's horrible what's happened here. And the the impact both on individuals and on the industry in general cannot be understated, especially because of SBF's role as this kind of figurehead for the industry and this guy who was really pushing a lot of the relationships to regulate and to regulate the industry along his terms, which was one of the big sources of conflict between him and CZ. You know, the other thing that I've noticed in trying to cover this story, because I spent the last two days in the deep in the freaking garbage can sorting through stuff and it's just such a yucky feeling. And what you find is that a lot of the stuff in this space, and I think this is true in general across the board in our industry, with budgets getting cut at media outlets and focusing on low-hanging fruit and just you know being driven by clickbaity stuff, is that so many of the stories are, are personality-focused. So, so much of the stuff around uh, this story was about like CZ and SBF, these two acronym juggernauts, conflict, and who's going to win and all this crap. And- what really gets lost on it is that uh, people's livelihoods, wealth, et cetera, lost, puff up in a cloud of smoke. So look, Mark, I appreciate you coming on to share what you can share with me today. I think we should all you know, remain skeptical about everything. There's so many different interests at play here. And uh, I think we're all eagerly anticipating whatever it is that you and your Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, co-author, or partner on this story are going to be releasing. I hope to have you back on when that happens so we can go through it because I'm very eager to do that. For anyone that wants to follow you and go through your timeline on Twitter, like that's one thing. What's your timeline on Twitter? What's your handle rather? And how do people want to contact you? How do they do that? Do you have a website? Like how do people get in touch with you? My Twitter handle is at Alder Lane A. A-L-D-E-R-L-A-N-E-E-G-G-S. And you can DM me from there. I have an open DM. I have no website. I'm in the website business. And, you know, just DM me, follow me. And just, if I make sense, say well done. If I don't make sense, say you're not making any sense. So that's how that works. Yeah, I think something's happening sooner than later. But we'll see. Should be something. Mark, thank you so much for coming on, man. And I look forward to having you back on when you have more to report on this. There'll be more to report, and I appreciate you having me. It was a whole lot of fun. And uh, we'll see where this all goes. It's quickly developing, as they say. Thank you, Mark. Have a great one and stay safe, all right? Yeah, take care. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. 
Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nikolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation on Twitter at Hidden Forces Pod or send me an email at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.